Richard Notkin is a full-time studio artist who lives and works in Vaughan, Washington. He received a BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute in 1970 and an MFA from the University of California, Davis in 1973. Richard has worked mainly in ceramics for over 50 years, averaging over one solo exhibition per year. He's held multiple visiting artist positions and has conducted over 350 workshops throughout the world. His work has been recognized and received awards from multiple prestigious organizations, including the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Richard has devoted much of his career to the service of institutions that promote the arts and the betterment of our shared society. With that, Richard, welcome and thank you for joining us today at the Donkey Mill. Well, thank you, Jake, for hosting me and um, fire away with your toughest questions. All right. <laughs> Okay, so curveball number one. Um, Richard, over the past two weeks, I've learned that you're a spry humorist and a lover of corny puns. I'm interested in how this light-hearted side of you coexists with the heavy, straightforward, and often distressing subject matter in your artwork. How do you keep your spirits high while focusing much of your creative energy on some of the more troubling aspects of the human experience? Whoa! Let's go on to question number two. Uh, no, I, uh, oh boy. Uh, well, I, I guess, um, I guess I have to start out by saying that I'm an optimist. I, I, if I wasn't an optimist, I wouldn't bother making work that has uh, social and political commentary because if I was a pessimist, what, what would be the point? I mean, I, I believe that survival is uh, the greatest motivating a uh, factor, quality of all species. Uh, survival has uh, certainly motivated my generation during the Vietnam War. We had the uh, we had conscription, the, the military draft, and uh, that's what put us in the streets, protesting, sure. getting beat up and arrested and tear gassed. And uh, it wasn't that we were any more moral or ethical than any other generation. It's because uh, we were being drafted and sent into a war we didn't believe in and we saw our friends going over there and some of them not coming back and the ones who came back were severely damaged physically and or mentally and uh, we protested. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about uh, the various dilemmas that lie on the horizon that are coming at us more and more rapidly, you know, as we, uh, especially today with uh, climate change, something we didn't even see coming 50 years ago. Uh, you know, I believe, I believe in the children that are being born in the 21st century that that survival instinct will kick in and theirs is the growing demographic um, and I just and I believe in art you know people have asked me uh, do you really believe that art can save the world well I don't know exactly that anything will save the world but I do know you know, can art save the world is probably the wrong question. The right question is, can art make a difference? And uh, art absolutely makes a difference. It, it illuminates the positive side of, of human existence. I mean, the spirit of creativity is, in, in all media, uh, continues to inform people that there's really something worthwhile mm -hmm about human beings, about homo sapiens, about human civilization. I, you know, we look back on history and, and I mean, when you think of, of, you know, when you look back millennium, two, three, four millennium, the things that come into your mind are, are the images, things that artists and architects created and ceramics, the things that have survived. You know, we, we know of the names of leaders and all that, but <clears throat> You know, we see the great works of art, you know, that have survived. And, and uh, you know, uh, who would know anything about the history of things like Guernica were it not for Picasso's great work from 1937? 
uh, we would know nothing about the town in Spain that, that, you know, that Hitler had bombed by his Luftwaffe or, um, you know, other artists, great protest pieces like uh, obviously uh, Goya's uh, Disaster of War Etchings or, you know, the songs of, of Pete Seeger and, and Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind, all these great anthems and... Uh, you know, films like uh, Dr. Strangelove and, you know, there's so many ways that artists have brought to our attention the insanity of, of, of war and other human follies and foibles. And, and uh, so, yes, art makes a difference and art continues to make a difference. And uh, as Gandhi put it, you know, enough grains of sand can stop the mightiest machine. So I'm, I'm just one of millions of uh, creative people worldwide who are just kind of dropping grains of sand. And I'm not going to make the teapot that saves the world, but uh, damn it, you know, my teapots are grains of sand and, and I keep doing it and I try to do it with humor because, uh, uh, I mean, humor is, it, it keeps me going, you know. Uh, so I don't walk around depressed, and, and uh, uh, in terms of making the art, I just love carving, and, and I love the processes I work with. So even though my subject matter may be dark, when I'm working on it, mm -hmm. I'm really not thinking about the issues. I'm just thinking about how can I carve this mushroom cloud to really look like a mushroom cloud, or, or you know, how can I how can I make a a Civil War cannon look just like a Civil War cannon or you know it's, it's the challenge of, of creating these images that I love the process of making the art the images um, I love making art I love my processes so it's it's a joyful experience but also knowing that I'm part of this movement of you know as John Lewis said of making good trouble mm -hmm. make trying to make a difference and, and that's what keeps me going. And I guess the bottom line is, it's my passion, it's how I'm wired, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's kept me going for 50 years. And uh, you know, now that I'm middle-aged, you know, I'm hoping it'll keep me going for the next 73 years. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so your, your love of humanity and your love of the process uh, influences your art uh, as a a message of the past to the present generation of what we have done that shouldn't be re, uh, created and as a message to the distant future to show uh, those people what humanity has done as well That's yeah a, a yeah I mean it's but, astounding yeah. to me that we keep repeating I mean you know especially today uh, uh, Putin sure. you know I mean it's like haven't we seen this in two major conflicts in the 20th century? It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's like John Steinbeck had a German soldier in Denmark in World War II in his book. I think it was, uh, oh, what was the name of the book? The Moon is Down? Uh, referred to the occupation of Denmark as uh, flies conquering the flypaper. So... No. But, uh, as I said, you know, uh, artists communicate. And, you know, I mean, even people like, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert and the late night uh, people that so many of the younger generation watch as mm -hmm. their source of news. They present it as comedy. Right. And they're making a difference. Mm -hmm. And they're artists, too. Yep. So. Well, to continue on the topic of politics and art, in a juror's statement, you said, and I'll paraphrase, uh, that the content of socially engaged art should not outweigh the craft of it. Could you elaborate on that advice for artists making politically charged work in this politically active point in time? Well, yeah, I mean, the way, the way I usually put it to students is that um, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to follow the path of, of uh, social and political commentary in your work, you should first and foremost be an artist. The work should be strong. Aesthetically, uh, 
technically, you know, you should make the strongest art you can because it's the art that becomes the hook. You know, that, that's where you grab your audience. The message, the message alone is not going to engage the audience. It's like, you know, the film Dr. Strangelove. You know, if it wasn't such a brilliant film, brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, brilliantly filmed in, in all of its aspects, you know, it wouldn't have grabbed an audience and, and engaged their minds and gotten that message across. Um, you know, great art, you know, in, in whatever it takes, you know. Uh, the skill of the artist, the content, the concept, the aesthetic. You gotta lead with the art, not the message. The message alone will never carry the art. The art has to carry the message. That's it in a nutshell. Well, uh, to continue with uh, some art uh, philosophy, um, you know, during your stay at the Donkey Mill over the past couple of weeks, you've spoken about the importance of pursuing one's personal passion and voiced staunch criticism of keeping up with popular fashions of the art world. Could you elaborate on this idea of passion over fashion? Fashion over fashion. You're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well... Um, you know, the art world's kind of a crazy place. Uh, the critic Jerry Salt said that uh, the art world is like high school with money. <laughs> and it, 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 you know, we, we need to have a new notion of success. And I think success really comes down to finding a path in your life that brings kind of a personal happiness. If you're always shooting for some notion of like art world success, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you follow the zeitgeist, you know, beware of the zeitgeist is how I always put it. Uh, fashions in the art world, in the contemporary art world, change so rapidly. I mean, every five years, it's kind of like, you know, the goofy crap that they peddle to very, very rich people who I don't know if they even buy that stuff, you know, on the runways of Milan and Paris and New York, you know, and I mean, who wears that stuff? Mm. Uh, it's Anyway, let me get back to the individual, though. I think every every artist really needs to find their own passion, how they're wired what they believe in, in expressing in their work. You know, if, if you want to be a potter, that's fantastic. Make the best functional pots you can make, you know? In fact, I, I know so many potters all over the country and, and in Europe and, and, and Asia who, who are kind of like the village potter. Mm -hmm. You know, they've set up and they've been working for years and they make a good living and they you know, they're raising families or doing whatever they want with their lifestyle and just, you know, and continuing to evolve in their craft. Um, but, but the point is, uh, you know, if you're an abstract painter, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, find out what it is that you want to express, uh, how you want to do Find materials, the media, the techniques that you're happy with. I mean, you know, an artist doesn't spend his time, his or her time being celebrated, you know, and opening receptions and, you know, uh, whatnot. You, you spend 99.9% .9 of your lifetime's hours in your studio, working hard by yourself. And you know, damn it, if, 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 if you're not working with techniques and materials, processes that you really love, that you're really engaged with, that you find challenging and you know, that you, you continue to explore through decades, you know, uh, then you're just gonna be frustrated and wasting your time. So if, if you're just kind of looking at whatever's popular at the moment, you know, you're, you're going to wind up very unhappy. And, and also, you know, chasing the zeitgeist, 
it's kind of like being the last guy on a chain ladder. <laughs> you know, you, you can't jump on that bus. It's already left the station. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just, it's silly. So, you know, I always tell, you know, when I'm doing workshops, and, and that's pretty much how I've been an educator for the last uh, 35 years or so, since I, I uh, left academia. Um, you know, find out how you're wired, find out what your passions are and stick to them. And at times you'll be very out of fashion. Doesn't matter. You know, it, it's all about your fashion, your, stick to it. You know, sometimes it's, in, it's wonderful to be different. When everyone's thinking alike, nobody's thinking. You know, stick to your guns, make your art, don't make somebody else's art. I feel like that's really critical advice, especially in an age um, where social media uh, posts of artwork can spread so rapidly and yeah. uh, gain that, that sort of zeitgeist that could change you know, within days, you know, ex exceptionally quickly. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and especially in the ceramic arts world, I mean, my God, I've been watching, you know, ever since social media started, I've been watching these movements where somebody will start doing something, you know, like the glop, slop, drop, and flop kind of mm -hmm. stuff, and then all of a sudden everyone's doing it, or the these uh, viscous, drippy kind of glazes, someone starts doing it, then everyone's yep. doing it. Or even artist statements, where you see the same sentences repeated in damn near everyone's artist statement. And you think, you know, that's the tyranny of the zeitgeist. Mm. Everyone thinks, you know, and, and, and again, you know, when everyone's thinking alike, no one's thinking. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like seeing people who are working differently. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who are on the edges those are the people that get noticed. And those are the people that I think are really sort of delving into what's inside of them. They know how they're wired. They're following their own passions, not, not the zeitgeist. They're not, you know, don't conform. Jesus, that's, that's the worst thing an artist can do is try to conform. You know, you, you got to be a bit of a rebel, you know? Yeah, what artist isn't? Well, yeah. yeah. You yeah. must. Well, uh, many young artists you know, have a pantheon of role models in the field of ceramics. Um, you know, as one of those titans in clay, you're something of an outlier in that you have made a career free of the trappings of a tenured university professorship. What advice can you impart to artists who want to pursue a career outside of academia? It seems like that's the draw. Ooh. You get an MFA, you go and you become a professor. That seems to be the track a lot of young yeah. folks go on these days? Well, it, it's a tough one, frankly. Uh, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, oh boy. It's, it's tough for me to give that advice because I was incredibly fortunate. I mean, the best advice I could give is no matter what direction you take, always figure out a way to maximize your time in the studio. You know, if you're really serious about being a studio artist, figure out ways to maximize your time in the studio. So when I got out of, when I got my master's degree at UC Davis in 1973, um, I was teaching adult education courses at night at the local high school. I was teaching two nights a week uh, and getting paid fairly well for back then. In 1973, I was getting $15 an hour and uh, uh, making $90 a week. And back then, rent was I rented a house and a garage for $130 a month. You know, I mean, we were talking... You know, groceries were about one-tenth of what you pay now. You know, gas was like 35 cents a gallon. and I mean, everything was cheaper. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, my, my wife also taught two nights a week, same pay. And we thought, well, gee, we, we could just keep doing this forever, you know, because 
teaching two nights a week, that gave us time. You know, we, we turned the living room of our house into a painting studio mm -hmm. for her and the uh, one car garage into a ceramic studio for me and we just thought let's just keep doing this uh, so i didn't apply for any teaching jobs i just thought this is great i have all my days free to make art and i just taught two nights a week and we could sustain our lifestyle you know as artists so uh you know we just had figured out a way to maximize our time in the studio I worked a full year doing that. Uh, I, I had two years of teaching at night. I started my last year of graduate school. And um, I made a lot of work. I just had all this work and just out of the blue, um, Bob Arneson, who is my uh, ceramics professor, that's why I chose to go to UC Davis. That, that's another thing. If you go to graduate school, you know, pick someone you want to, uh, study with that's the most important thing someone you think that you know can relate to what you're doing and i saw arneson's typewriter with the fingers and i thought holy shit you know <laughs> i gotta go there plus i saw the stuff that was coming from the west coast like patty warshina and howard kotler fred bauer jim melcher clayton bailey david gill hooley and it was just like you know the funk movement i was like because that's what i was doing with ceramic sculpture uh, Ken Ferguson, who was my professor at the Kansas City Art Institute, wanted me to go to Alfred. I thought, what the hell would I want to do that for? <laughs> what I'm doing is happening on the West Coast. But that's a side story. So anyway, I spent a year working because I had maximized my time in the studio. And I had all these cabinets full of just little sculptures. I was doing all these little balancing sculptures back then. And... Uh, I was sitting in my studio on a hot July day. Uh, it was about 110, 112 degrees in the Sacramento Valley, and I was wearing uh, tie-dyed underpants that I wore to my draft physical. They were pink and baby blue and yellow, and I had a huge jufro out to here and a beard, and, and uh, there was a knock on the door, and uh, it was Bob Arneson and this gallery dealer, Alan mm. Frumpkin, from New York City all Natalie dressed and and uh, Bob says uh, uh, Dick uh, it's Alan Frumpkin he came by to see my work and asked if there are any other artists you know around that he should look at he wants to have a show of West Coast ceramics in his gallery in New, New York City and uh, can we come in I said oh geez you know here I am I'm just standing there in my tie-dyed under jockey tidy whiteies and Thought, oh God, did I blow it, you know, hippie, and, you know. And, uh, but I started opening cabinets and showing him all this work I had been doing. And he liked the work, and, you know, long story short, he, he uh, wound up taking it to New York. I had my first group show, along with Arneson and a few other people, West Coast Ceramics. He sold everything. He raised my prices, sold everything. And about a year later, he had West Coast Ceramics too, and sent a bunch of work back, and and uh, he doubled the prices that time, and sold everything again, and and uh, and I've been showing in New York and places like L.A. and Chicago and other San Francisco, you know, it just, and I was only about uh, 23, 20, 24. 24 years old at the time, so right out of graduate school. Uh, but the moral to the story, I mean, what I'm getting at here is uh, it was a very serendipitous thing. I was very fortunate. I was in the right place at the right time. This incredibly serendipitous event occurred. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't have the work together, if I didn't have all these pieces, I was just making for the sheer joy of making them. I had no exhibition deadline, nothing. But I had just start, had this philosophy of maximizing my time in the studio, making a lot of work. And so when this surprise event happened and the work was there, I made a connection and, and I never looked back. I mean, it was... You know, had I not had that work, had I not maximized my time in the studio and this 
hotshot gallery dealer from New York came in, it would have just been a, you know, hi, goodbye, you know, another California hippie in tie-dyed underpants sitting on a stool on a hot day in, a, in his garage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maximize your time in the studio, make work, make your best work, and, uh, you know, get it out, get it out, get it seen. Uh, when something like opportunities arise, if you got the goods, it's kind of like, you know, I guess my advice boils down to figure out ways to maximize your time in the studio and figure out ways to make enough money to get by. You don't, you don't have to live a luxurious lifestyle. In fact, get used to not living a luxurious lifestyle. Uh, you don't have to have that, you know, $50,000 salary right out of graduate school. It's more important, I, 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 it's more important to have time than money. Time is the greatest asset an artist can have. Time is another material, it's, it's another tool. That's, you need time to make your work. So figure out a way to maximize that time to make your work. And then wait for that opportunity when you get lucky to apply all of that hard work. Yeah. Well, don't just wait for the opportunity. As I say, I was incredibly fortunate. Make the opportunity. Make the opportunity. Get the work out, you know? But first you gotta make the work. But then, you know, apply to shows, uh, get a strong body of work together, get it in front of whatever eyes you, you can, but get it seen. And the other thing, all of the grants I've gotten, and I've got, you know, early in my career, I got about a dozen grants. And I found that by getting the work out and seen, you know, I was in exhibitions and museums and stuff, and you usually, you generally, I mean almost entirely, you, you don't know who's going to be on the juror's panel for a grant. But I found that uh, on, on virtually every, almost every grant I got, when I looked afterwards at the panel, there was like a curator or a director of a museum or someone like that who I didn't know personally but they were part of an exhibition in some way that I had work in. And later when I was uh, asked often to be a juror for exhibitions or grants or whatnot, I found that, you know, with my other jurors, if there's someone on that panel that's actually seen the work and can vouch for it and say, I've seen that artist's work, I know that artist's work, it's really good. Your chances go way up. So get the work out. Get Even if out. you don't get into the initial uh, application, they've still seen your work and then that travels that way. Is that what you're Yeah, saying? but no, I mean, yeah. yeah, get it out, apply. Just keep applying. Get, get the work into various shows, you know, for ceramic artists. Uh, you know, there's, there's the annual juried shows at Ensica. Mm -hmm. there, there are so many other shows. And I know it's kind of a pain in the ass because sometimes these things are expensive and shipping costs have got up. But look for the good ones, you know, the ones with catalogs, the ones that are national and repeating. And, but try to get the work out, get it seen. There are no guarantees. There is one guarantee. It's not easy. That's, I, I, it is not easy. It will never be easy. But what the hell is easy that, that's really worthwhile? Uh, it's always going to be a challenge. Um, and that's a good thing, you know? The, the, the best works I've ever done were an incredible challenge. And sometimes I procrastinated starting them for weeks, months, even years. And, and, and there's a fear level that I've come to recognize that fear is an indication that something great might be about to mm -hmm. happen. Because I look back on maybe the four or five best pieces I've ever done, and damn, I procrastinated starting them mm -hmm. for a long time because I was so afraid that I was pushing 
my aesthetic and technical and skill limitations beyond anything I'd ever tried before. But when I did it, it worked, you know? And sometimes you fail, but you learn from that failure and you try again. So it's never easy. And uh, don't think it's easy. You know, if you want easy, um, uh, move to another planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. Yeah. Um, okay, Richard, now that you have 50 plus years of experience in ceramics and have spent many a muddy day in the studio, why not retire to some sunny tropical island and leave all this toilsome artwork behind? What motivates you to continue to engage in the creative process? Well, I, I, I have retired. I, I, uh, I'm now self-unemployed uh, <laughs> and I've taken up a hobby. It's called ceramics. Oh, I and no, I, uh, I, I guess um, what, what I'm doing is really unfinished work and it always will be unfinished, unfortunately. Um, Something I learned as a as a youngster, because uh, I was born just shortly after World War II, in a Jewish family. Uh, my father uh, fought. He was in combat in the U.S. Army. Went in through France and Belgium, and into Germany. I was in the Battle of the Bulge, and um, also came upon. Uh, some uh, recent uh, a, a genocidal, uh, you know, Holocaust sites when they was when they were anyway. Uh, but I was raised with a Jewish education, and some of the uh, people in our synagogue were Holocaust survivors with the uh, you know the concentration camp tattoos, and they taught us to always be alert and aware and active. And, you know, that the beast isn't dead, it's only sleeping. And, of course, we see that today. Uh, and I'm not talking about just anti-Semitism. I'm talking about so many uh, types of genocide against so many others. You know, there's, there's uh, uh, just within the last decade, we've seen the rise of, of fear of others in, in so many cultures, so many nations, so many, and, and especially our own nation, you know, with the rise of, of Trumpism and, and this uh, cultish uh, following in the Republican Party and, and, you know, the situation in Ukraine. You know, the, the beast isn't dead, it's only sleeping. Uh, so it's unfinished work. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I, I at one time thought that, uh, you know, I would, I would die with the best ideas still in my head and that bothered me. And now I think I will die with the best ideas still in my head and that excites me because it means that I'll always still have really good ideas to pursue and so now you know, when you're younger, you don't think about this, but as you get older, you know, I know that uh, I have a few years ahead than I have behind me. And so now it's kind of a race. Uh, you know, I'm trying to pick out the best ideas with the time I have left. And, you know, it could be uh, 20 seconds from now. It would be well documented. and <laughs> Or it could be 20 years from now. Uh, but I, I have this new idea that I'm pursuing. I'm getting rid of deadlines in my life because I, I no longer want that tyranny. You know, I've been on an exhibition treadmill for the last 50 years, and I just want the freedom to just make what I want as I go. And I have this idea of just creating this final piece in my studio. And I have, I know what the core is going to be, and I just want it to continue to expand outward. Kind of an installation piece, and uh, and when I'm when I'm gone, there will probably be there will be 
sections of it that will be unfinished, maybe even un, well unfired, and that's it. That's it. And 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 so the idea fits my concept of how this type of work, social commentary, activism. It, it's really an unfinished. You know, it's it's something that people will never be able to stop doing, and. Uh, um, so this is my new challenge. You know, it's not like act two or anything. It's just sort of, this is my final idea for a final piece. And when I'm gone, I just want uh, whoever survives me to just offer this to any museum that wants to take it, just give it away. Um, and, uh, and it's a challenge, you know, because it allows me to even though I know the core and the main focus and message of the piece is sort of a summation of everything I've tried to say throughout my career. The way it meanders and, and spreads out and the new images I'll bring to it and all of the old imagery that I'll be putting into it um, is just going to continue to evolve and, and, and uh, so it just seems like a good way to to uh, to finish my my uh, work as an artist, and and uh, yeah. So I, I you know I think I think artists you know we we, we don't really uh, the true artist doesn't really retire. You know it's. Um, I may not be, you know, I, I can't spend 10, 12 hours in the studio anymore like I did early, earlier in my life because I just don't have that energy anymore. It's 73. An eight-hour day in the studio is a pretty good day. And uh, I, I recently did an all-nighter just because I had to. I had to finish a piece that was on deadline, etc. And damn, it nearly killed me. And... Uh, but you know, six to eight hours in the studio is a nice day, and I do go in my studio almost every day. I take a day or two off a week to work around the house, do a little landscaping, and uh, I try to catch up on the never-ending list that Phoebe gives me. <laughs> Things to do. But uh, now, if you're an artist, it's 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 inseparable from your life. You know, you, you don't just retire and take it easy, and uh, it's a passion. It's, uh, you know, and, and I think the activist side of it keeps me going, too. You know, it's, it's um, uh, when I did my closing address for Ensika uh, five years ago, you know, I, I, I got pretty emphatic, and I said, uh, you know, Nobody fucks with the future of my granddaughters, and damn it, I, I that keeps me going. You know, it's like I, I can't stop. So, you know, if if um, you know, if you ask me a question like, uh, if you had to choose between being a political activist and an artist, because I see the two as being really meshed. You know, I would probably come up with an answer like you're you're like asking me to choose. Do I want my head severed from my body or my body severed from my head? You know, I, 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 I can't. It's, it's just, these things are my passion, my life. So, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing some time of your life with us here today and for the last couple of weeks at the Donkey Mill. Yeah. It's been really you know, enlightening to speak with you today and I'm glad we have it uh, on camera so uh, more people can uh, enjoy this conversation as well so again thank you Richard mahalo well, uh, well thank you Jake it's it's been a real pleasure being here it's always a pleasure being here and uh, um, yeah you know uh, you know artists should should express what they feel deep in their hearts and uh, should never be afraid to reveal their passions. 
what's what's the point <laughs> so you know even if people think you're nuts well we're all a little nuts but it's wonderful being nuts as an artist so thank you thank you